Uh, thank you again. Um, I want to say that I'm not going to make any groundbreaking presentation. And so if that is the expectation, sorry, I will disappoint you. But the promise is that this will be refreshing. So yes, it will be a refreshing debate or argument or exchange of ideas. Now I chose this topic, uh, made a presentation somewhere, and right now we're still in the process of fine tuning it. I used to be a journalist, as uh, he rightly pointed out, and I, coming from the African continent, there are some stereotypes that go on. And so that, in a way, prompted me to deal with this issue. But before I do that, I'm going to show you some images that will not bother you in any way, because we are talking about violence, but I chose the less violent images to show. And uh, this is uh, the Rwandan genocide, uh, 1994. Notice what was used. And other instruments of destruction were also used. Uh, this Kenya, you can see the same instrument being raised. It was also used on human beings. And you can see what's behind the story, the, the background. And this one, again, is uh, part of the consequences of that destruction that went on. And I'm going to explain it in a moment. And this, of course, the soldiers and the security agencies did not just leave everything to go on and on. At some point, they came in to try to arrest the situation. And this is a photo of one of the perpetrators of the violence. You can see when the tables are turned, is now pleading for mercy, which he did not extend to other people. And so, uh, before I go on, I think I need to give you some background, because I'm, I'm sure not so many of us are very familiar with this play, uh, with Kenya and what took place in 2007. They had uh, a presidential election, the first real, so to say, democratic, in, to a large extent. Uh, election, uh, but it again resulted in a dispute. The opposition party thought they were uh, winning, and um, at some point they claimed that there was an electoral magic, and the people who were leading ended up losing. In any case, that's not what I'm discussing today, who won, who lost. But the fact is that President Mwai Kibaki was re-elected, and then there was violence. And uh, about, according to the BBC, about 1,500 people died and uh, we had internally displaced people or persons, refugees in Kenya. But the world did not allow the conflict to keep rolling on. Uh, the United States, African countries, everybody came together. At the end of the day, Kofi Annan, former United Nations uh, Secretary General, stepped in and he was able to broker peace. And uh, what they did was to get a, um, a government of national unity. The president, Kibaki, retained his presidency, but the opposition leader, uh, Raila Odinga, became the prime minister. And that's exactly what they still have till today, pending the next elections in about uh, two years. All right, so that's a bit of uh, background uh, but my question, my primary question, as we have in every research activity, is to ask myself, how did the Kenyan media report that uh, post-violent period in the history of Kenya? Why? If you go back to the photos I showed you, the images I showed you, one of the things we notice is that each time we have a violent conflict in the African continent, uh, there is always that rush to say, ah, the media have been actively, you know, fueling the conflict. Um, and it is not just by people who observe African politics from this side of the globe, even within the continent. 
And that's why I pulled uh, Kasoma, who said even from Angola to Liberia, each time you'll find that the media have been actively fueling the crisis. But probably the most widely used you know, example is that of uh, Rwanda, where the radio station LTLM radio station actually encouraged uh, Hutus to come out and kill the Tutsis. And they, it was framed, although we'll come back to that, the framing was if you don't kill the Tutsis, they will end up killing you because they've already killed your president. And so that's the backdrop you know, for, this, uh, for this study. Now, let me quickly go through the main features. But before I do that, and that's why I'm saying it's not, it's not something new, but will be refreshing uh, in a way. Uh, it's something that started out as a uh, quantitative study, moved on into a little bit of philosophy of journalism, and then ended up in media ethics. And I'm happy that Professor Babcock is here to answer any ethics questions you might pose. <laughs> I'll, direct, <laughs> I'll direct to him. OK. And so um, getting back to this, I defined you know, uh, the media as nation and standard. These are newspapers. And I will make reference to this definition at the end of the presentation. Uh, the reason is that both of them, the nation media group is so wide. It, I mean, it's in Tanzania, it's in uh, Uganda, cuts across East Africa, it's huge. Uh, between the nation and the standard, they control about 70% um, of the newspaper readership. While we are crying here that newspaper readership is declining, there are some parts of the world where readership is even increasing. So it's not something that cuts across uh, the board. All right, now both of them are privately owned, so they are not necessarily reflecting uh, government position or official position on issues. Uh, they are actually quoted in the stock market, uh, Kenyan Stock uh, Exchange. The theory I have used here because we are trying to talk about how things are portrayed, and that's why we're dealing with framing, which we know is, uh, has to do with some selection you know, of what you perceive as reality and presenting it in such a way as to compel some attention and direct people towards whatever you want them or how you want them to uh, look at an issue. All right, so that's why I chose that theory. Method is co uh, content analysis, and I looked at uh, news reports, front page of uh, Nation and Standard, as well as the House uh, editorials. Now it's important to note that when, if you are coming from the African continent at least, if you say editorial, it means it's not just what Uche writes as comment. It means what the collect, uh, collective thinking of the newspaper. And the equivalent here will be the house editorial, which does not go with uh, any byline. All right. And so, the front page uh, stories, I had to choose January because the thing happened in December of uh, 2007. Um, same thing with the house uh, editorials. Of course, since we're dealing with one month, uh, it's very prudent and wise to use uh, the entire population. I couldn't start splitting again into taking a sample. Uh, my unit of analysis were the stories front page stories, as I mentioned, as well as uh, the house uh, editorials. And how did I classify the information? Uh, stories about peace meetings, the news stories, violence, and others. Uh, on the other hand, I looked at the house editorials, the ones that advocated for peace, um, and others. And I have 78 uh, news stories and uh, H&I House uh, editorials. And now, what are the results? And this is where the quantitative thing comes in. But this is not statistics that should frighten anybody in this room. It's just one plus one giving you two. Um, um, I, you can see that they have, uh, oh, this shifted a little bit. Almost 50% of the stories, um, the peace meetings, even when they 
referred to the violence. It was within the context of making peace. And so that's 31%, and then others, 19 All right? If you also look at the editorials, the house editorials they used, again, it's overwhelming. It's on this, this seven, yeah, 73% was on advocating for peace. And the others, 27%. And now, what I did here is a little bit of what we are familiar with, the chi-square analysis, to find out are there differences in the way these two different newspapers handle the same story. Now, these are the percentages, but what's important, as we know, is this one, to show that there are no significant differences. In other words, they approached the same issue basically the same way with a little bit of uh, differences here and there. I also looked you know, at the editorials. Where they different was the one calling for peace and the other one calling for war? No, still the same answer. Um, the chi-square also tells us that the differences, yes, differences exist. When we say significant differences, they exist, but they are not statistically important. So they're just minor uh, differences. So that's what we have here. And then my trip into the quantitative world, qualitative and, <coughs> sorry, the qualitative and quantitative world will end at that point. And we start asking some questions. One, like I said, most of the time the story from Africa is, oh, where are you? Are you a journalist? Ah, you must be responsible for the crisis. No, but this is a different scenario where some newspapers consciously deviated from that, you know, uh, stereotype. Uh, so it challenges in a way. Now, there could be other places where other newspapers are doing the same things in, in the continent, but I only chose this one to show that it is not always that story. Uh, Rwanda, oh, they encourage everybody to kill everybody. Um, according to the tables I've shown you that you will see that the nation and standard uh, dealt more with the peace efforts, more than, much more than every other thing. The house editorials went the same way. And as uh, Bill you know, pointed out in the introduction, the media played uh, the role of moral witnesses <coughs> in society. Moral witnesses in society. Is that my coinage? The answer is no. I'm, I'm not the person who brought it up. And this is what I mean. I tried, I've been battling with how to pronounce the last name. Ignatius. Yeah, Ignatius. Thank you very much. Uh, his contention is that journalists should be moral witnesses in society. And that it gets to a point when journalists should be morally engaged. And what he talked about was a little bit like what the Red Cross or Red Crescent, what they do. You come to a crisis situation, you don't say, okay, fire on. You try to arrest it and provide an opportunity for the crisis you know, to, to die down. And this concept was taken up by uh, Plaisance, you know, who is also in, uh, in media ethics. Uh, he described the distance, which at times we put as self-destructive detachment. Self-destructive detachment in journalism. Now, why is, this, why is this very important? Because we are in a school of journalism, and what do we do? Oftentimes, we tell our students that, you know, in order to be very objective, you should be uh, uh, light years away from whatever it is you are, <laughs> we are talking about. So you move away and let the people make uh, their choice. Uh, but we discover that this form of objective detachment uh, at times leads to an escalation of crisis. What do I mean? You come here, Hutus, you always say, in your broadcast or whatever you're writing, 500 uh, Tutsis, uh, Hutus have been killed. Tomorrow, what do you find? Headline, another 300 Hutus have been killed. And then the Tutsis who are reading the same story probably are coming up with a uh, conclusion that, okay, it's time to fight back. And the crisis keeps escalating, escalating. And that's the objective way to look at it because 
If you count the number of people who are dead, there's 500 or 300 on the other side. While you may not mean to serve as a catalyst, you know, or to inflame the crisis, but that's what uh, is going to result at the end of the day. Um, and that's what the choice for the Kenyan journalists at that point was, were they going to be objective bystanders, bystanders and, uh, or moral witnesses as defined by uh, Ignatiev? I think they opted to be morally engaged in the, sign, in, the, in, the, in the march or in the quest to look for peace, a way to find a peaceful resolution to the crisis that had engulfed the nation. They were not just objective bystanders watching the destruction of their country, watching and helping to escalate the brutality that was going on. They were not interested in the decimation of their nation. They were interested in how do we halt this disaster so that the nation can move forward one more time. And they made that conscious effort, you know, to, uh, uh, to be moral witnesses in society. In a way, when we look at the, uh, the BP oil spill, although it, I'm getting involved in some, I'm about to enter into some highly contentious uh, region. You recall that initially when we started seeing those nice, you know, pictures, and I'm using nice now in, in quote, in quote, sorry. The thing was flaring up, you know, things were going and we are reporting. Can you imagine that it was BP versus another oil company? They might be competing who can flare more than the other. But at some point, the CNN and other media houses in the country said, oh, this is not just about flaring, uh, you know, this thing is happening. Are you giving us access to the data? No, they asked the question. How about the people whose lives are being destroyed? So it was not just a matter of reporting and then putting a distance. No, they got involved at some point. They became moral, kind of moral witnesses, asking those questions. How about these people whose livelihood will vanish because of that? So in a way, they became you know, morally engaged in what was uh, going on, just as the Kenyan uh, journalist made that conscious effort not to watch their country go down the drains. So, we ask ourselves some basic questions for which I confess I don't even know the answers. <laughs> Can the Kenyan example be uh, a model for conflict reporting in the continent and elsewhere, including the United States? I don't know. Uh, where do we draw the line between this idea of uh, moral engagement and what I, now this is my term, disengagement from journalism? Can you be so morally engaged that you end up disengaging yourself from journalism? Who knows? Thirdly, can moral engagement coexist with, you know, uh, the sustenance of the tenets of journalism? fair and balance, accuracy, objectivity again. Can those things coexist? So these are the questions I ask myself, and unfortunately, I did not provide the answer, and that was why I warned you at the beginning that this will be a refreshing kind of activity. And everybody can join, and then we can go out from here being more enlightened or accommodating more <laughs> ideas than the ones we came in with. Um, but my conclusion is that it is true. Journalism is not about peacemaking. We are not the United Nations, where you go and talk and make peace, and at the end of the day, you hope to be awarded the Nobel Prize for Peace. That is not our business. But can we create the environment that can lead to peace? I think the answer is yes, as the Kenyan journalists did, because they kept writing, they kept insisting, they did not relent. 
the foot was on the gas pedal all the time, that what the country needed at that point was peace. And at the end of the day, it happened in the country. So this, these are my, the way I will conclude. But uh, again, this study has its own limitations. As I called your attention to it at the beginning, the, probably my definition of the media is a little bit narrow. I limited it to the newspapers, influential though they are. But then, how about the television? How about radio? How about social media? How about you and I talking? So there are other things I did not put, and those will be nice you know, to talk about in some other studies. Uh, did I provide the guidelines for moral engagement? I did not. And probably, and I don't have the answer, like I said, probably that's what, uh, by the time we leave here, we might be getting you know, some ideas as to what you know, moral engagement means if we buy the concept in the first place. And so I will end by telling you Asante Sana, that is thank you in, uh, actually it's Asante Nisana, the plural version, because we have a Kiswahili teacher here. So, uh, thank you. And uh, while I welcome your questions, please do not fire missiles at me. And uh, don't throw your shoes. My name is not George Bush. 